Hello, and welcome to the second session on Torah and Us Today. And I'm so pleased that you've been able to log on with me this evening. And um, we're going to ca carry on from where we left off yesterday. Let's just open in a word of prayer. Avinu Malkeinu, our Father and our King, Yitz Kadesh Shimcha, may your name be sanctified in our lives. Tavu uh, Malchoticha, may your kingdom come in our lives. And Lord, I pray that we would submit to your rulership on earth as we are still here, and that your kingdom would be alive in us, that we might submit to it, and that the area in which we move and have influence, that your kingdom will be here on earth as we walk in your ways. So I pray that you will help us today as we hear this, as I teach this, and anything that is not of you, Father, I pray that you'd help me not to say it in the first place, but also that if I do say things that are not of you, that you'd uh, help folk who are listening to forget. So I pray for your inspiration, for your Ruach HaKodesh, your spirit of holiness, to help me today to bring this message across. I ask it for Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, in the name of Jesus, our Messiah, our wonderful Messiah. Amen. Well, I'm going to share the screen and I'm going to take you through the um, next bits of this talk, which is part two. And this is on the Apostles' writings, which I think I've said to you before, I prefer to call it that rather than the New Testament, because the moment we say New Testament, we sort of imply that it's replaced the old. So I'm looking at the Apostles' writings and Torah. In other words, is there Torah? Or if you prefer to use the word law, which I don't particularly like because it's not correct, but that's fine. If you prefer to use that, that's fine. So let's, we're going to see what that says. And let's just see what we've done so far. We've looked at what is and what is not Torah. And I try to show you that we need to be sure that we don't get confused between what is actually written in the first five books of Moses and the prophets. If, you know, the prophets confirm it all. But we need to be sure that we're not mixing it up. Some of the um, rabbinic interpretations of what is written in the Torah um, were, not, were possibly not what it was meant to say, although they've had much more experience of reading it and studying it for a thousand years longer than we have, and they take it seriously. But we need to be careful that we're not mixing that up. And also, since the time of Ezra, they've added certain things that, um, we'll, and I'll show you that, that are actually more additions, and we're going to talk about that as well. And those additions became traditions. And a lot of times we think, for example, you know, having a, 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 a Shabbat lift that goes up and, up and down because we can't pr press a switch. You know, that might put us off sometimes. And then we think the whole Torah is bad or not relevant to us. So we need to distinguish between what is written in the Torah and what is an added tradition, be it an oral tradition or an interpretation that has caused a particular way of looking at things. And that's really what we're going to look at today in the, the Apostles' writings. How does the Torah come through to, in the Apostles' writings? Does it? And would it even apply to us? And that's what we're going to look at. Um, and then tomorrow, we're going to look at, tomorrow evening at five, we're going to look at how a Christian relates to the Torah and the Holy Spirit. In other words, what is the role that the Holy Spirit has in enabling us in terms of Torah? So, remember I showed you that um, the first Shavuot at Exodus was very similar to the second Shavuot at Acts. And that it seems that what God was saying to us, that the one he wrote on the Torah on the stones, the, the ten words, and in, at Pentecost, or the second Shavuot, he wrote it on hearts. And that's a key issue that I want to deal with as well today. So if we're talking about the Apostles' writings, let's start with Jesus' view of Torah. What did he think about it? What did he say about it? 
And Matthew 5, 17 onwards tells us all about that. It says, think not. And often we stop there. And we think not. And we say, may God add to add his blessing to the reading of his word. And we close the Bible and go away. But we must read on. Think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. Now, that's the, the, the key phrase. And he carries on. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now, often we think that that fulfill was like when you order something from Amazon.com or Loot or whatever, that when it arrives, it has now fulfilled the order. And it's a very um, arbitrary translation because he, how, how would he say he's not destroying it or the prophets, but now it's fulfilled, so it's finished. So one of the translations that we have in many Bibles is that it's finished, or we're not translations, but the way we interpret this fulfill is that it's finished. It's no longer applicable to us. And, um, and then we say, okay, well, so you see, we, we are not under law, but under grace. And we'll look at that in the third session tomorrow. But this fulfill in the, um, from the Greek, the word is playru from Strong's Concordance. And it means to fill up, to level up, to, to bring it, you know, all together. Or it means to furnish it to satisfy it, to execute it, a whole period or task, whatever, or it means um, to complete or end or to be made full, or it means to finish. And it seems that what most folk do today is we translate, we take the, the one word is finish, where all the others talk more about filling up, making full, okay? And if we've got any doubt about that, let's see what the next thing that he says. The next verse, for truly, absolutely, be sure about this. I say to you, till heaven and earth pass, not, sorry, one jot or tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, the Torah, till all be fulfilled. So the, the point is, we're sitting here, and I'm looking out of the window, and it's a beautiful day, and I'm on earth, and I can see the sky, and at night we see the stars. So we know heaven and earth has not passed away. And we know that not everything has been fulfilled yet because we know Yeshua is going to return and he's going to set up a millennial kingdom and then there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. So it has not been fulfilled yet. And this, but we need to take seriously as well. It's the next verse. Whoever therefore shall break one of the least of these commandments, and I'm not going to go to, into detail what the least is, but it's one of these commandments and shall teach men, teach others. So, about breaking them, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoops. But whoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, I don't think that means you won't be saved. If you break one of these things and you teach others to do it, you're not going to be saved. I'm thinking it's talking about the kingdom of God, where he rules here on earth and um, now, in the, in the, the now and the not yet. He rules through us, and his kingdom is brought at the time when he was resurrected. He brought the kingdom through the Holy Spirit, and um, we have a job to do in this kingdom, this thing that he's, he's asked us to do. And if we, we work and live in that kingdom and operate in the, in the kingdom, the way the kingdom of God is, I'll talk more about that just now. That's what he's talking about, not about going to heaven. And that's unfortunately how we misinterpret what he said there. So that's what he said. Now, what did he do? Because that has a, a huge impact on, you know, it proves what he said. So let's first have a look. We know that one of the key commandments is about um, remembering and keeping the Sabbath and keeping the festivals. And we, here the was one is Yeshua kept Pesach, which means Jesus kept the Passover. Remember he said, to the, the uh, to these disciples, go and talk to this guy who's carrying the water pot and say to the guy, the owner of this room, the rabbi says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Pesach meal with my Talmud, my disciples? And he did that. And as we know, this instituted the, the, last, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, the communion, whatever you like to call it. Um, and we know that he was actually having a Passover seder because of the way that he washed 
instead of washing hands, they washed, he washed their feet. The way he broke the bread and he dipped it in the, um, the, uh, um, ach, man, the bitter herbs with Judas. So we know that happened. We know they sang a hymn afterwards, which is the way that it goes. And, you know, that's the way that they keep the Passover. And he referred to the third cup, which was the cup of the new covenant. So all of these things tell us it was a Passover that he was having. And, and just to say that this picture is not really, this is anachronistic in the sense that it's, it's, they didn't wear kippot, they didn't wear yamulkas. This only was developed later in about the 1900s. So the picture, unfortunately, is not correct. But there you can see the four cups of the whole the Passover. And then we know also he kept the Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot. Because on the first day, they have this wonderful uh, torch lighting ceremony on the walls of the temple. And um, it's a huge thing. You can see the lights down in, in the Jericho Valley, in the Jordan Valley. And it's a wonderful thing. And he, he speaks to them and he says, I am the light of the world. So he refers to these huge lights. And he says, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. So we know he was keeping Sukkot or Tabernacles. We know also that on the last day, the eighth day, Tabernacles, which is called is an eight-day feast, on the last day the fest of the festival of Hoshana Rabbah, the great day of the feast, Yeshua stood and cried, if anyone is thirsty, let him keep coming to me and drinking. What was he talking about? Well, the, um, the priests used to go all the way down to the pool of Siloam, and then they would fill up water bu uh, buckets, if you like, walk all the way up to the temple. Of, uh, so they do this a couple of times and they would fill up a huge laver and they'd go up and down blowing shofars. And by the time the, the, when the laver was full, then they would tip it down and the water would pour down the streets and down through the Kidron Valley, down to the Jericho, if, you know, if there was enough of it going all the way down. So um, this is what he was referring to. And he, we know that he kept that day too. And then, we know that he kept wore tzitzit. Um, and this is from the complete Jewish Bible. The, you know, the, our translations like the King James and the NIV and all those say they touched this woman, touched the hem of his garment. Um, and obviously the, the translators reckon we, you know, modern Western people wouldn't understand what tzitzit were or tassels were. So they just called it the hem of his garment. But it came here and if one looks at what it meant, they begged him that the sick people might only touch the tzitzit on his robe and all who touched it were completely healed. So we know that Jesus wore tzitzit. Um, the Greek word is actually kraspadon, um, which does mean um, tassels. And um, so it's just that the, in, when it came to English, it, like, we got it, you know, we missed the meaning. And the idea was that if you had, if you wore, as they did in those days, a four-cornered garment, like a poncho, they would put the tassels or the tzitzit on the four corners. And it was really to, remember, to, get, to get them to remember to keep um, God's word, the Torah. So we know that. Now, a lot of folks say, oh, yes, Jesus broke the Sabbath, you know. Because remember, he healed on the Sabbath and you're not supposed to. Well, did he really? Let's have a look at the slide in Matthew 12. A man there had a shriveled hand looking for a reason, sorry, shriveled hand, full stop. Looking for a reason to accuse him of something, they asked him, this must be the, the Pharisees, the scribes, maybe the priest, is healing permitted on the Shabbat? But he answered, if you have a sheep that falls into a pit on Shabbat, which of you won't take hold of it and lift it out? Okay. How, and by the way, there he's referring to Deuteronomy 22.4 which it says that if an ox falls down, and even if your enemy um, ox falls down in the road, you are to help it up, okay? And, and restore, you know, get the animal back on its feet. Then he says, how much more? Which is a, a very Hebraic way of thing. It's, it's a saying. It's a, um, a way of expressing oneself. It's the kol vachomer, which is how much more, how much greater, or how much more valuable is a man than a sheep? There he carries on. Therefore, what is permitted on Shabbat is to do good. So then he so he's not breaking Shabbat. He's actually in line with Deuteronomy, and he's doing that. Um, he, he's explaining what's actually happening. And what I love about this is that immediately afterwards he says, 
<laughs> then he said to the man, stretch forth thine hand, and he stretched forth, and he was restored whole. The one hand was restored whole, just like the other. So in a sense, by working this miracle, he was proving that what he said, he had the authority of God, the authority to heal the man's hand, and and therefore the, the authority to, to explain this. He wasn't changing it. He was saying, this is the way you interpret it. You take the whole Torah and you look at what is more valuable, what is greater. And the same question, of course, is the issue about, remember he said soon after this, he said, um, Sabbath was made for man, for the benefit of man. And what a wonderful um, gift that God gave us. It was grace that he gave us because in those days, everybody worked, they didn't have a rest day during the week. And the Israelites in the Torah, this is the first place where a day is instituted for man to rest and animal and servant and everybody else. And so it's actually a, it's a gift from God. And why people get upset about, oh, must we keep the Sabbath and all this sort of thing or a day of rest? No, this is a gift to us that Jesus, that God gave to us. And then just to say, you know, I don't want to knock in any way what the uh, rabbi said because Jesus actually supported two of the chief, the key rabbis um, around his time. The one was Hillel and the other was Shammai. And in one case, he actually quotes Hillel, where we think he may have, because he says a very similar thing. He says that Hillel said, that which is hateful unto you, do not do unto your neighbor. Now, that's an interpretation of what the scripture says. And Hillel was quite right. And Yeshua agreed with him. But he said it differently. Hillel said it in a negative way. Do not do to your neighbor. Jesus put it in a positive way. He said, whatever you wish that men would do to you, do so to them. For this is the law and the prophet. So here again, he's saying, this is a summary. This is, an, this is the essence of what the law and the prophets says. So he agrees with Hillel. And then in another case, he disagrees with Hillel, where Hillel taught that a husband could divorce his wife for any reason. Okay, now that's not what the scripture says. That's not what the written Torah says. Where Shammai insisted that infidelity should be the only grounds for divorce. And that is what Torah says. And Yeshua agreed with Shammai. So he agreed with them when they agreed with Torah. Okay, and uh, yeah, so I think that point is made. Then the other thing is, a lot of folks say, oh yes, but remember on the Sermon on the Mount, he, see, he kept saying, but I say to you, so he's contradicting the Torah. It seems like it. He says it six times. But look, let's just have a look at what, um, the, what he actually said. Because modern scholars, scholars, particularly Hebrew scholars, who look at what the Hebrew words are um, and say, what was he actually saying? He was saying, it has been said. Now, if one understands that there's an oral tradition that the rabbis added from the time of Ezra, then during that tradition, um, that was what they said what had been said. That's oral to incorrectly interpreted from thing. And um, those are the three times he said that. They said he said that. The other he says, "You have heard that our fathers were told," and that agrees with Torah. And he makes he takes that and he says, "Yes, I agree with those," um, and he makes it more internal. And remember, he says, "Don't hate because then you." might end up murdering. He says, don't look with the lust of your eyes because then you might end up committing adultery. So he's not saying, look, I'm, I'm disagreeing. He's saying he's making it actually more internal. And if you don't think I'm talking, saying, giving you the truth here, this is what it says just after that. You have heard that it has been said. There you have oral tradition. Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. It doesn't say and hate your enemy. The oral tradition does, but not the Torah. See, so he's saying he's taking them back to the written Torah. But I tell you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. You know, and I could give you lots of examples, um, which I will be doing a little bit later. You can go through it for yourself to see. I will be sending that out if you want to or get me to send that to you. So let's see, what did Yeshua say in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5? Just a little bit more information on that are the commands that he mentions. And remember, in Matthew 5, he goes up a mountain, he sits down, he teaches the people, 
And then at the end, he comes down the mountain and Matthew 5 is very clear to say that basically he's trying to, the, the, the writer of Matthew is saying, this is what happened at Mount Sinai where Moses went up the mountain, he received and he taught the people, etc. So he's, they continue. So are the commands that he mentions in that whole Sermon on the Mount, um, adultery, murder, and oaths, are they the only commands that he mentions? Because remember, those are the ones I've just referred to, the buts. But this and but that, okay? Um, you'll actually see that it's not so. Um, he's teaching the, the whole of Torah, not just the Ten Commandments, because these are three, these are examples of what? From the Ten Commands, okay? But he also goes on and he says, so I've said that those are six, seven, and nine of the Ten Commandments. But he also speaks about giving. Remember about don't make a big fuss of how you're giving so everyone can see you. He's talking about ten, temple giving, the tithing system that they had in the temple. And um, he's saying don't make a big show of it because then you lose the blessing by doing it in private. So here he's referring to one of the 613 commandments, which are also in Deuteronomy and in Exodus and in fact, the, 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 the temple commands, a lot of them come out of Leviticus. So these are just examples. So he refers to a whole lot more in that passage of Matthew as well and in other places. So he is saying that these are the only ones of which, so is he saying these are the only ones of which we need to take note? No, he's using these as examples. Then we have a look a little bit into Mark we there's this whole issue of washing of hands so let's have a look for the pharisees and indeed all the judeans those who lived in judea and okay they're not doesn't mean jews all the jews just those who are living there hold fast to the tradition of the elders that's what i was talking about um which was that's oral traditions okay it's not written do not eat unless they have given their hands a ceremonial washing and just to say, by the way, these written oral traditions were later written down in the, um, not the Chamosh, I've forgotten the word for it anyway. Um, and then later on, they became part of the Talmud with all the, the um, commentaries about that. But they don't eat unless they've given their hands a ceremonial washing, netilat hayadim, the washing of hands, which is still part of the traditions today. So also when they came, when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they have rinsed their hands up to the, the wrist. And they adhere to many other traditions, no? such as washing cups, pots, and bronze vessels. Um, now, I just want to say, this doesn't mean that the oral traditions and the tradition that they have are bad. Because during some of the plagues, the Gentile people around them in Europe, around the Jewish people, the communities in Europe, the Gentiles were dying left, right, and center. And the, the Jewish folk weren't, didn't have anywhere near the sort of mortality rate. And the, the people, the Gentiles, suspected that therefore the Jews must be poisoning the wells or doing something to them. No, it was because they washed their hands and the germs were being spread by, hand, by, the, you know, by, by not washing hands by the Gentiles. So in a sense, this tradition has merit, but just to know it's not written Torah. So they were judging the disciples based on an oral tradition. And that's what this is all about. The Pharisees and the Torah teachers asked him, why don't your Talmud live in accordance with the tradition of the elders? There it's repeated again, but instead of they eat with ritually unclean hands. So this is all about ritual that um, it did apply in terms of if you were going into the temple and you were a priest, but it didn't apply in everyday life at that stage, written in the written Torah. And then <clears throat> Yeshua says to them, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. And he's very forthright here because they're part of his family. Remember, Jesus was a, a Pharisee, most likely. Um, as it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far away from me and he carries on in the next verse their worship of me is useless because they teach man-made rules as if they were doctrines as if they were torah and those were the things that yeshua actually said to the folk you know look take my yoke upon me you it's light the yoke was the yoke of torah 
Whereas the, the, the yoke that the, the Pharisees had put on the people were really breaking their backs in many ways. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. But then he says, you depart from God's command, the written command, and hold on to human tradition. Indeed, he said to them, you have made a fine art of departing from God's command in order to keep your tradition. And you remember they had ways of getting around honoring their parents by swearing by this oath and that oath and the other thing. And they said, that doesn't matter as long as you don't do it this way. They had all these ways and Jesus didn't agree with them at all. So then it gets to this next bit. I'm carrying straight on. Remember, the context is the washing of hands. Okay. And um, this is what he says to them. Don't you see that nothing that enters a man from the outside can make him unclean? He's talking about germs from the hands from the marketplace coming in if you haven't washed your hands and making you unclean. He's not talking about food. Okay. For it, do, it doesn't go into his heart, but into his stomach and then out of his body. Now, they've, in some translations, not all, just a few, they've added this. And you'll see it's either in a faint text or in italics or it's in brackets. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. Now, when you see it in italics or faint or in brackets, it means it was added later. They, it's not in the earliest manuscripts that they have. And they think that this was added by some well-meaning translator who, or scribe who thought he would add this to try and explain what Jesus was actually saying from his perspective. You see, not understanding what was going on. Anyway, so when you see that, just remember, think clearly about those things. Don't take it as gospel, okay? And he went on what comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. So he's turning the whole thing around. From within, out of men's hearts come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery. Greed, malice, deceit, law, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. Now, what do you notice about these orange, these ones in yellow, these texts? They all come from the Ten Commandments. And envy and sl sl slander and greed and those things are in others outside of the world. Well, the Ten Commandments summarizes a lot of it, but they're in the other 603. And all these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. So, unfortunately, we have, because of this little piece in brackets, reckoned we can eat things that God did not declare food. Uh, I can't go into that now, but there's a God said certain things are food. You can eat any of those things. But a few of these things here are not food to you. Therefore, don't eat them. So, this was not what was being said here. And if you have any question about this, remember, Jesus had disciples, and they'd been walking with him for a a while, quite a while, and he was teaching them, and none of them had contact with non-Jews. Why not? Because the Gentiles, the non-Jews, were pagans. They had idols in their homes. They ate food that was sacrificed to idols. They ate things that were not declared food by God, and so the Jewish folk kept separate from them because uh, otherwise they couldn't go in and worship in the temple, so they were kept separate. And then after, this was all after Jesus was resurrected from the dead. So it can't be that he suddenly changed all these laws. And um, they continued going to the temple and going to Shabbat. Um, but they never went to, um, to, uh, to non-Jewish homes. So there we have Peter. He's sitting on the roof of the Tanner's house in Jaffa. Or Joppa in those days is called Jaffa today. <clears throat> and he sees a vision of a sheet with a whole lot of what are called trafe animals or the, that were not declared as food by God. And God says, take and eat, Peter. And Peter says, no ways, Lord. This is after Yeshua's crucifixion. He says, no ways, Lord. I won't eat anything that is unclean, that is not given as food. And God says to him, don't call what I have made clean, unclean. And most of us in the church today said, oh, well, this maid says that God declared foods clean. And we link it with that passage I just talked to you about. But Peter still refuses. But the point being that just as this is happening, as he's seeing this vision, these two servants of a Roman centurion come knocking on the door of the tanner's house and say, please, won't you come, uh, our master, our, the, come, and, and then... That he, they go, he, Peter goes with them up to Caesarea up the coast and he meets with them 
and um, he, he realizes that what it's really saying is that he can now go to their home because he's saying, don't call, because remember they call the Gentiles unclean. So he's saying you could go to the, the Gentiles home. And this is what he said, if you've got any doubts, because the uh, Roman centurion called, called Cornelius says to him, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I know that you guys don't come to our home, so I really am appreciated it. But by a vi I had a vision where an angel said to me, go and find this guy called Peter sitting on a, in, a, in the Tanner's house in Jaffa, Joppa and bring him to, to me. So that's why my servants came. And then Peter says, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or to visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. So we must read the scriptures carefully. He said that God was the vision was to say, don't call man unclean. Now, if we've got any doubts a bit about it a little bit further, then Peter began to speak. And as he was speaking, the Holy Spirit was poured out on these Romans, these Gentiles. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. And remember Cornelius did what was right. He, he donated to the, um, the Jewish people, to the temple, and maybe to some medical things or whatever it was. But the point was that the Holy Spirit came on them in exactly the same way that the Holy Spirit had come upon the disciples on the day of Pentecost on Shavuot. So he says, okay, he now understands twice he says so. And in fact, he says it again later, and I'll show you that as well. So he's not talking about except men from every nation. The Gentiles, actually, this is where the Gentiles were actually joined and became part of the commonwealth of Israel. And then as we go on in Acts, a little bit further, about 49 of the common era, which is quite a long time later, um, maybe 15 or so years, maybe 18 years after Yeshua was resurrected, we have this huge problem because Paul is going around preaching in the diaspora, the areas outside of Israel, and many Gentiles are coming to know Yeshua as their savior. And there are some guys who are running around saying, well, you've got to be proselytized. In fact, the early ones did all proselytize. They were circumcised. They became part of the Jewish faith. And slowly but surely, Paul realized, now, hang on a minute, they don't have to do this. And that's where the whole argument is in Galatians. But anyway, we, we won't go there now. We will later, tomorrow. So the point was he told the story and then Peter gets up, as we know, because it says so in Acts, and I'm going to read this to you, then you'll see what the context was of what happened. Yaakov, that's the brother of Jesus, the younger brother. Um, they'd all been explaining, he says, you've heard, hear what I, but hear what I have to say. Shimon has told in detail what God did when he first began to show his concern for taking among the Gentiles a people to bear his name. So that's Simon Peter, okay? And by the way, Yaakov, uh, he's actually the head of the church, not Peter. If we look at this. He's the guy in charge here in Jerusalem. Okay. And the words of the prophets are in complete harmony with this, for it is written. See? Written. So he's now going to quote the scripture. And he quotes from Amos, Amos so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, that is all the goyim who have been called by my name. So we are goy, we are the rest of mankind, and we are Gentiles who have been called by God's name. And he carries on. Therefore, my opinion, this is Yaakov, is that we should not put obstacles in the way of the goyim who are turning to God. Now, when he says obstacles, what he's meaning is that it's, it's uh, the Jewish faith the, the, of the time had lots of... Uh, rituals and ways of doing things and all the sort of thing that uh, the Gentiles would have battled with but just to suddenly do things and you know so he said let's not make this difficult for them particularly let's not have this issue of circumcision and circumcision I can tell you as an adult is not funny um, it's a very serious thing if you know what happened with Abraham and we know what happens in our eastern Cape area where they have these initiation ceremonies. Many of the people die from it. But the point is that don't put obstacles in their way. There were many obstacles, not just circumcision. But anyway, it says we should write them a letter telling them to abstain from things polluted by idols. Why? Well, that's where idolatry, uh, the second commandment, comes in. Um, from fornication, well, the, the Gentiles had idols there and they actually, um, uh, they had sexual things and with temple prostitutes, male and female. 
in the temples, which was part of their pagan, their pagan traditions. From what is strangled, which were related to the way that you kill animals in a humane way, not making them suffer. The Jewish way had a, a very quick, painless way of slaughtering animals and from blood. And whether this means murder or whether it means drinking of blood, I'm not too sure because the pagan traditions also did drinking of blood. Okay. And he carries on. Four, from the earliest times. So, sorry, let me just go back here. These, these four rulings here actually relate to the Noahide laws, the, the laws that God gave to Noah or the commandments that he gave to Noah when Noah came after the flood. They came out of the ark and they sacrificed. And these were the four rules that God gave to them then. And then he carries on. Four, from the earliest times, Moses has in every city those who proclaim him. Uh, in other words, teachers in, about who teach the words of Moses. In other words, who read the Torah. Um, who proclaim him with his words being read. Moses' words. In other words, Torah. Being read in the synagogue every Shabbat. So what he's saying is that just as the, uh, the Jewish believers in Yeshua went to synagogue, uh, every Shabbat, so did the Gentile believers who came on. They're going into the, to the synagogues to hear now. This is part of the, the, what started happening. So let's make it easy for them in the beginning, but just the key issues that the Jewish and Gentile people can have table fellowship, they can meet in each other's homes, and they can eat together. Let's just sort that out. And then they're going to slowly but surely learn as they hear the Torah read, because that's what Moses read, the first five books of the Moses, book, books is what Moses read, and that's Torah. And they're going to re hear it every Shabbat. And slowly but surely, they will get the message, and they're, they're living their, their relationship with God, and their relationship with their fellow man will get sorted out. So, um, when Yeshua says, keep my commandments, now, this is another issue that, you know, we have this problem coming up quite a bit. Um, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments in John 14. So what commandments? If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. Now, there are two things here. Do you think his commandments, Jesus' commandments, are different to his father's commandments? Yeah, quite right. They're the same commandments. It's not as if there's something different that he's giving. We'll talk about that in a minute because maybe you have that perception. And notice this bit about abiding in his love and abiding. We're going to talk tomorrow a lot about what this word abide means. And here he says, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, by the way, the 10 words in describing the 10 commandments, the asaret, haba um, imim, I think that's the word. I'm, uh, miss, I'm, I'm not, not awake yet. Um, he's talking about words. The other word for words is commandments. Um, you abide in me. You shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Because remember, he's talking there about commandments anyway. So it's his words. Whether you just want to say his words, well, fine. What did he teach us with his words? So how do we know if we abide in him? There's a clue here. Yes, if we keep his commandments, we're abiding in him. So he didn't throw them out. And then the answer, as I said, it's if we keep his commands. Now, I'm going to show you some commandments in the New Testament. What? Am I joking? <laughs> I'm not joking. If you have a look carefully, there are about 1,050 commands. Let's say over a thousand commands of the in the apostles' writings of the New Testament. Now, some of them are repeated, they said the same way, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. Um, and so you could say there are 271 different commandments. And I'm going to show you, I can send you a document which will show you that those 271 are all in the in Exodus and Deuteronomy. Of part of the, you know, the, and I'll show you which ones again, I'll show you in a minute. Um, the only one that is not listed there is to keep Shabbat. And I think the reason was that it was so entrenched that was understood by everybody. You don't say to a person, do something that everybody is doing anyway. Okay. 
they don't say thou shalt or shalt not. And that's why we don't recognize them. Because in the Torah, the Hebrew language is very much active. It's verbs. Do and don't do. Okay. But in Greek, they were very much airy-fairy, more than philosophical, the way you think and all the rest of it. So that is why in the, in the apostles' writings, they say, let this be how you behave. Or don't let this be done. Or don't let this be seen among you. And that's why we don't recognize them, because also they spread out right throughout the uh, apostles' writings, the New Testament, and they're not n nicely put into a whole sequence as we saw in Exodus and in Leviticus and in um, Deuteronomy. So then folk often say, but now hang on, um, let's have a look. I'm sure this isn't right, but it is, because there are lots of other examples. I'm just going to give you one here. And when you start reading the, the apostles' writings with this understanding, you will see this. I've, I've actually gone through the whole of it, and I've taken out every verse where there is a commandment. And it's, it, it, you can find it quite easily. So then here's just one. This is from, um, well, I'm not sure where it's from. I think it's from, uh, no, it's from Jesus. Yeah. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren. Oh, no, no, this is in, from Thessalonians. By the Lord Jesus that as you have received of us how you eat or to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. So if you walk and please God in a certain way, you will be blessed. Okay, that's what he's talking about. And he's beseeching them and exhorting them in or by Jesus' name. Okay, for ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. There Paul is saying we gave you commandments from Jesus. For this is the will of God. Commandments are the will of God. Okay, Even your sanctification. So he's saying that by doing what the Lord wants us to do, the will of God, we are set apart. We become sanctified. We, become, we start to walk in the holiness that he um, put upon us. Okay, it's, He imputed righteousness to us. But we've got to actually now start forensically showing that, to actually live that way more than just what he thinks, that he should abstain from fornication. So in other words, he's saying fornication doesn't go with sanctification. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel, his body, in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of cons I don't know what that means, concuspicence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. So he's saying, look now, guys, you, you, he's talking to Gentiles in Thessalonians, so you guys, you come in, don't carry on the way that your other Gentiles do in their pagan traditions, in lust and fornication and all this sort of stuff. That no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any way. By, by the way, that defrauding is part of the 603 commands because that the Lord is avenger of all such. Uh, this is, by the way, in the teaching to the, um, about business practices. God will avenge as we also have forewarned you and testified. So here you can see, here's a clear example of Torah in the New Testament. And then just to go back now and refer, remember I showed you these 613 commands unpacked into 15 categories, only so that I could fit them onto one page. Then you could split them into many more categories. And we said that the ones in white are about um, honoring God and honoring your and work, living together in harmony with your neighbor, okay? Not do, beating them down, treating them well. Do you see those? Okay. The ones in yellow, we said, don't actually apply to us because we don't live in Israel. We are Gentiles, so it's not about treating the Gentiles. The, the temples have been destroyed, so none of these apply, except tithes, funnily enough. Well, they don't actually apply, but the, our pastors love to quote this the passage here about tithing because it suits us, but it actually, the tithing applies to the temple and the tabernacle system. Okay, although the New Testament does, the apostles' writing do talk about honoring those who work among you. Anyway, and then the red is dealing with certain illnesses, and I've spoken to you about that. If we'd kept the 14-day quarantine for this coronavirus, this was 3,332 years old, this command. That's the same thing, keep 14 days of quarantine. And then the three green ones here, only apply if we're a businessman, only apply if we're a, a judge or a magistrate, only apply if we're a farmer of some sort, and then only apply if we're at war. And then again, those yellow ones don't apply either. So, because we're not a king, and only if we're taking Nazarite vow, which we wouldn't do. So here we are. I'm going to give you an example. 
in the Torah, it says, you are to have no other gods before me. One command. In the New Testament, it says, thou shalt worship God only. See, it's put in a positive way. Again, you shall serve God only, positive way. You shall love God wholeheartedly, perfectly. And there you see the passages. So it comes up in quite a few verses, but I've counted it only as three commands because it's said the same way in Luke and Matthew there and da, da, da. And then Matthew, Mark, and Luke here. So, but I've just counted it as three commands because it's the same word. But really, it's one command. When I match them, those would add up to the one over 1,000, the 1,050, if we added those and all those three. But if you take them down to what are they actually, it's actually one and one there, the same here. To honor the old and the wise, the elderly, honor your parents. You see here, it's going into a lot more detail uh, of against the, in, in terms of the one, uh, on, uh, honor your your parents, your father and your mother. Um, but that's part of the 603, the way that this is written. And then if you look here in the apostles writing, he follows the faithful and patient, Hebrews, let worthy elders be doubly honored, Timothy. The younger ones are submit to their elders, Peter. So again, that's counted as three in the 1050, but in terms of the um, actual, I counted it as one. And that brings us, if we just count the ones, eh? one and one, we get up to 271 different commands of the Torah laws, laws and 194 of them are positive. You'll know the, notice these are written in a more positive way. If we look at the Torah law, more of them are written in a negative way, but still they're more positive than negative. And then um, 77 negative ones, and they're covered in the New Testament commands. And if you're doubting me, let's have a look at some more of these. These are part of the 603, to love all human beings, uh, here there are six commands about loving, but if you look at it, it's actually one command. You know, this is some, this is a detailed and unpacking of love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, but in the Torah it goes to a lot more detail, and that's why you end up with six hundred and three plus ten. But the ten would cover one of the ten would cover that. Okay, and then he's in in the uh, apostles' writings. There are fifteen occurrences. But again, I've just counted it as one. So I hope you get that uh, idea that the, the uh, apostles' writings have um, Torah in them. And um, if you send me an email um, to pwgowest, all lowercase, pwgowest at gmail.com, I will send you the full list of all the 613 commands and all the 271 Apostles' writings commands in little blocks next to each other, like like this, um, so that you can see these actually came out of my list. So then you can have a look through and you can check whether what I'm saying is true or not. Or as I say, you could go through it and just look for every command and you'll see it there. So let's have a look here. The New Testament assumes we know the Old Testament. As he says, uh, Torah, Moses is read every Shabbat in the synagogue. And so when it says, for example, in the Apostles' writings, no fornication in the Tanakh. There's a whole description of not to have sexual relations with your sister, your mother-in-law, your daughter-in-law. And it's almost a whole page in Exodus about who you could not have sexual relationships with. But the Apostles' writings say there's no, just no fornication. And it summarizes, it captures all of that. They knew exactly what that meant. Okay, Because this is what the pagans did. And when it says, love your neighbor... It's exactly the same thing. How to treat strangers, slaves. By the way, slaves is really servants, people who ran out of money, who were poor, they owed money. They could go and work for a Jewish person who would give them board and long week and, and uh, lodging. If they were a family, they would give the children and the wife board and long lodging, and they looked after them. If they could pay off the debt in before the seven years, they would be released. But after seven years, whether they'd paid off the debt or not, they would be released because all debt was cancelled. And so you, that was how to treat strangers and neighbors and slaves and business partners. So slaves in the Hebrew is not the way we think of it. There were some slaves which were became slaves after a, a, a war battle. And they also specifically was how to treat them. And it's very kind. It's, it was far better than any of the laws around that time. And not like the slavery we see in modern or saw in the modern days. Then, summary of part two, and I'm virtually finished now, is the law abolished in the New Testament? Well, Jesus kept the law perfectly. Because if he didn't, he 
would not have been an unblemished sacrifice. He could not have paid for our sin. If he'd broken Torah in just one way, he could not have been the perfect sacrifice for our sin. He could not have been our Passover lamb. Okay? Had to be unblemished. That's why he was inspected for four days by the priest and the people and by Pilate and by Caiaphas and Annas and all those guys. Okay? Jesus said it was not abolished and we should teach it and obey it to be great in the kingdom. And um, we see that he emphasized the Ten Commands by saying it was not just externals, but also in the heart. And he also mentions some of the 271 New Testament commands. And as I say, they match all of the Ten Commands and the applicable 603. And when I say applicable, I mean the ones that I had in white, not the yellow and green and so on. Or except, as I say, um, the, the business ones, businessmen, farmers, and j judges. But the, the, it matches all of those that apply to us in general today. So we will be carrying on tomorrow in part three. And I look forward to seeing you uh, on the Zoom. And uh, we're going to have a look at how does a Christian relate to the Torah now that we've established that it's actually in both the Torah, the Tanakh, the Old Testament and the New Testament. What does that mean for us? How do we relate to it? How does it apply to us? And, and we're going to see what the role of the Holy Spirit is in terms of that. And that is the role of the Holy Spirit is extremely important in all of this. I'm sure you will realize it when we go through. You probably realize it already. But it's not a case of, oh, well, that's fine. Then we don't need that. We'll have a look at that tomorrow. So thank you very much. Let's just close. Father, we thank you for this time together. And I pray that the words, as I've said, that you want to stick will stick in those who have listened and those you want to, don't want to stick will be forgotten because you know what where each of us is in the journey and what what you're wanting to do with us at this particular stage in our journey so we ask this in Hashem Yeshua HaMashiach in Jesus name amen and just to say guys now that I've shown you the Torah in the Old Testament Torah and the new um, this is not something you use as a judgment tool to beat people over the head or as the Pharisees were judging everybody all the time with it. That's not for us to do. We're on a journey with the Lord and other people on their journey and what the Lord has not shown to some people, he may have shown to us, but if he hasn't shown it to other folk, we don't judge them for it. That's one of the commands again that Jesus gave and that is in the Torah. Okay. So thank you very much for listening. Bless you. And we'll see you tomorrow at five.